This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 74, recorded on March 6th. 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Hey, how are you doing? How welcome, are things? welcome back. Thank you. I was I was where it's cold. I went to Boston <laughs> from San Diego, and that you well. Know, it requires heroism on my part. <laughs> it is very cold in these parts. We have had we've had pretty cold winter. Yeah, and of yeah. course, where you are, it's been seventy two and sunny all the time, right? 60, 65 right now. But did you have a lot yeah. of rain last week? Last week, yeah, I wasn't here. The first rain in about ten months. Wow, really bad drought, and it's not enough. Yeah. But there was some snow in the mountains, and that's going to help. Wow. Also joining us today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. How you doing there? We're doing good, but we still have real winter. It's it's about you know thirty seven degrees, and it's raining and cold and dark. And I would think I was in Chicago, but my father reports the snow is as high as an elephant's eye, and I said <laughs> that's. That's from Oklahoma. How can that be in Chicago? And my father's going to be 93 in July, and he says he has never seen this much snow in Chicago that he can remember. I mean, it's it's just incredible. Michael, last time we we recorded, you said you had Chamber of Commerce weather. We did. Degrees. How can that be? Now it's freezing again. Um, <laughs> uh, all I can say is the polar vortex. Wow. The weathermen here have been explaining it ad nauseum. All right. Well, it's good to have everyone back. Michelle is away today. She couldn't join us. So it's us. It's up to us to make some compelling stories for our listeners. And before we do that, I have a follow-up. We have a comment from Katya, who is an author on the paper we did last week's on Cyclops. And she writes, thank you for the great podcast. You've explained our story very well, and it was funny to listen to it. I didn't know that Speak, Friend, and Enter is from Lord of the Rings. I just wanted to explain the name Cyclops because this was a question mark in the podcast. And she gives a link to a paper where they describe the Cyclops mutant phenotype in the wild type plant, the fluorescently labeled rhizobia, enter the root by the formation of an infection thread. In the Cyclops mutant, the root hairs, the root hair curls around the bacteria but further infection is impaired. And because this looks like an eye of a cyclops, the mutant derived its name from it. That's neat. Uh, Alio, it was a cool paper. Uh, last I know, week. I missed it. It was, it, was, uh, it was all about the plant, but, you know, it's very interesting how the plant attracts the rhizobia, and then the rhizobia yeah. stimulate the formation of this uh, structure. Yeah, it looks like a, cro like a bishop's crook. Uh, it's really cool stuff. And the protein, a, a major transcription factor is called Cyclops. Right. So that's yeah, it. You did a good job. I listened to you guys. You guys were terrific. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Katya. I'm, I'm glad that you listened. And uh, today we have two very cool papers. Really, really cool papers. This field is just full of cool stuff. <laughs> right? I mean, you, you, don't, you don't have to look very far to find amazing, amazing stuff. I got an email from the president of my institution's administrative assistant pointing to this this one paper that we're going to do today about the 30,000-year-old distant relative. Yep. And, and in her response, she said, holy cow. Holy cow. Phil Rizzuto. Yeah. So the first one is a paper of Alios. And let me, I want to read the authors so that you don't have to, Alio, because there's so many of them. It's Huznik, Nico, Koja, Ross, Duncan, Fuji, Tanaka, Saito, Baktrog, Wilson, Von Dolan, Fukatsu, and McCutcheon. 
The title is Horizontal Gene Transfer from Diverse Bacteria to an Insect Genome Enables a Tripartite Nested Mealybug Symbiosis. It's published in Cell. Let me tell you, not only are there 13 authors, <laughs> but they come from three different institutions in Japan. One from the Czech Republic, that's the first author. One from the UK, University of Miami, University of California, Berkeley, Utah, Montana. Now, this is as good an example as I know of the new trend, the new world we live in, where every paper is multi-authored and has that many different institutions. This is a wonder. I mean, this is only possible in a world where communication is instant and cheap. So uh, in the old days, as you remember, a typical paper was the once-a-year paper that the PI and a graduate student wrote. That's right. That's and now right. that's gone. And I, I think it has amazing consequences. We ought to talk about that someday because I think this is changing all of science. You know, Alia, that's... Maybe for the better. I, I agree with you. The problem is figuring out who's first author on these things. <laughs> I know, I know. Right. That's a mess. Really. And that's yeah, when they come up with the ampersands or the asterisks. That's right. Yeah. And it yeah, drives right. everyone crazy. Yeah, I know. It is a problem, but on the other hand, it represents the way science is actually yeah. being done these days, and that's probably the more important part of it. So, I don't know. I think it's a good thing. No, but nevertheless. So, should I start yeah. on this? You want to hear what this means? Love to hear it. Or is, all these, these words here are really phenomenal. Horizontal gene transfer. Tripartite nested mealybug <laughs> symbiosis. Boy, isn't that quite a mouthful? So, first of all, the subject is symbiosis in insects. And symbiosis, I think, is everybody's favorite subject. I don't know, there is something about the human mind that responds to having two genomes interacting. You know, sometimes they do it in a bad way, but most of the time it's in a good way. And um, there is something I. I I can't quite figure out why this is that's so appealing, but two two genomes are better than one. Do you agree with me? Absolutely. That's why we have sex, right? <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> now you talk. <laughs> but there is more to it, and I'm not sure I know quite why, but that's a fact. So I think that symbiosis are not only, a, uh, but not only are they exciting, but they're important. Uh, it. It's a little bit unclear to me what role they play in evolution, but it's very clear they play a major role. They play a huge role in adaptation, in the way an organism responds to changes in the environment. But uh, symbiosis is certainly plays a key role in evolution of many organisms, and probably insects are the best examples because they are rife with endosymbionts. You look into the cells in the in the gut and elsewhere in practically every insect, you find bacterial endosymbionts. And there they are, uh, they do something very important, essential in fact. So in a way, the only, the only thing in mammals that resembles that is the ruminants, cows and goats and sheep and camels which cannot live without uh, bacteria doing some of the degrading of the food into usable nutrients. Why don't we have? Uh, why don't we have endosymbionts? Now, there's, you know, that's a good Talmudic question. It is. I was, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I was going to ask Elio the question: Is it because we're too young? Mammals are too young when you contrast them against insects. We just haven't figured it out. That's a great way of looking at it. You may be right, but the the answer really is nobody knows. Let me tell you that I, I recently gave a talk on, on the general subject of symbiosis, and I pointed out that there are certainly bacteria which are very long-lived in humans. The best example, of course, is TB, leprosy, and rickettsia. Now, rickettsia belong in these conversations because they, they tend to become organelles like Mitochondria used to be rickettsia. Anyhow, there are examples of long-lived endosymbionts in humans, but uh, they don't seem to be essential, certainly. They're facultative. Most people can live without them. But there's a possibility that, like Mike, uh, Michael uh, indicates, these may develop into an obligate endosymbiont someday, given enough evolution. But we're not there yet. 
So right now we're dealing with insects. And as I say, with insects, they do all kinds of things. And they're especially noted for their ability to provide amino acids and vitamins to insects which cannot obtain essential elements like that in their diet. The best examples are aphids and psyllids and other sap sucking insects. Sap, I'll remind you, and herbaceous plants is mainly sugars. So if you live on sap, you're getting a sugar, a carbohydrate-rich diet, but you get no vitamins to speak of. And, only, and, and you cannot, insects in general can make only 10 of the amino acids they need, which is about the same number that we do. So where do they get the rest? Well, they get them from bacterial endosymbionts, which can Utilize the sugar, get the nitrogen source from someplace, and convert it into amino acids, which are then fed to the host. Okay, so now the story gets interestingly complicated because in some cases, one bacterium can do the job. Okay, there are bacteria like Buchnera in aphids, which can provide the host with everything it needs, and it's essential. I'm sure that if you were to treat insects with an antibiotic that kills their endosymbiont, they would starve to death in no time. But in many, many insects, the story is more complicated. So, for instance, in some psyllids, which again, sap-sucking insects, you find not one but two and the symbionts, and they complement each other. Some do um, one kind of a biochemical job along a pathway, and the others fill in with the other with the missing enzymes, missing from the first endosymbiont and provided by the second one. So this is really it gets very very complicated. Then this goes back to at least 260 million years, according to calculation. So Michael is right. We are very young in this scale of events, and it may take forever for us to evolve into uh, protectors of endosymbionts, let's say. It also now, points out the importance of the universality of biochemistry. That's right. How true, how true. This is the same, well, not exactly the same pathways, but very similar. And usually, if you look at the pathway for each of the amino acids, you find that uh, many, many enzymes are common among uh, vertebrates and insects. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah, that's true. That is, the, the exceptions are actually quite interesting. But anyhow, one of the things that characterizes endosymbiont of insects is their genome reduction. Instead of having an acceptable size genome, let's say at least a couple of million base pairs, they go down to a half a million base pairs, 500,000 base pairs, and further down even, so that there are... The world champion, I think, is something like 120 genes, 139 KB, which is uh, one of the ones we're going to talk about. It's called Tremblaya, after Mr. Tremblay. Mm. I don't know who that was. Anyhow, uh, Tremblaya is about as small and, and uh, has as small a genome as you want. However, it's not small itself. The cells are quite good size, the bacteria. They are all contained in an organ called the bacteriome, which has the insect organ, and it has insect cells called the bacteriocytes, which uh, have this bacteria inside of them. Now, the story is that in at least one kind of Tremblaya, very tiny one, it, it really has very little to speak for itself. It has essentially just enough genes to make macromolecules, although interestingly enough, it lacks those for T, for amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So how does it get them? <laughs> <laughs> and here's the, here, therein lies the tale. It's been known for some time that Tremblaya is not only a bacterium inside an insect, but it has inside of it bacteria. So it's an endosymbiont with endosymbiont. So this is a Russian doll, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's nested. This is what they talk about, nested symbiosis. And this has been known for some time and uh, was discovered by one of the authors of this paper, which is Carol von Dahlen. And she's been working with uh, all these people, to include the last author is John McCutcheon. And John McCutcheon has been working with the 
person who's done most of the work on these endosymbionts, who's Nancy Moran. He was a postdoc with Nancy, and she, she has moved recently f from Yale to Texas. Anyhow, and, and I, I mention her because there is a parallel paper to this one, which I'll bring up later. Let's, we, that can wait. Anyhow, so the story is the following. If you look at the endosymbiont of the endosymbiont, it's called Moranella after Nancy Moran. You find that Moranella actually, even though it's the endo-endo, has four times many more genes than the <laughs> than its host. Okay, so that's kind of peculiar, and it does seem to complement the, the two. So that mo by and large, if you add up the genes of both. Uh, they add up almost to what it takes to make the, all the required amino acids. But, and they realize the tale, not quite all. Not all genes are the product of the sum of those two genomes. They don't quite add up to everything that's needed. And other genes are necessary, and those genes reside in the nucleus of the insect. Fine. Mm. Okay, that sounds, it sounds familiar because you know that when mitochondria arose from the acquisition of endosymbiotic rickettsia, they send most of the genes to the nucleus. So it could be something like that, but it's not. It's not. That's a great story, but it's not the way it works. Here, the genes required for amino acid biosynthesis that reside in the nucleus are of bacterial origin. Hmm. <laughs> okay, yet other bacteria. And these are amazing. They've been acquired, obviously, by horizontal gene transfer. Who knows when? And who knows exactly what they are? But by bioinformatics, you can guess what they are, and it's really quite a, quite a collection. So you find that most of them come from a few groups of bacteria only, and these are bacteroidetes, Alpha proteobacteria and gamma proteobacteria. These are gram negative bacteria that uh, some of the readers will recognize and others won't and don't have to. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so there are at least uh, three bacteria that have donated the genes to the nucleus of the insect. Now add to that what's, what's left. Add to that genes from the Tremblia, that's the big endosymbiont with the small nucleus, no small genome, and the moranella. So you have a total, uh, and plus the aphid, you have at least six genomes interacting. Hmm. Uh, this may not be the world's record, but it sure is a big number. Okay, so this is really the story. This is a tripartite nested symbiosis because it involves the nucleus of the host into which have creeped, crept in bacterial genes at some unknown time, plus an endosymbiont and an endosymbiont of the endosymbiont. That so this is truly bug-to-bug bug <laughs> transfer. <laughs> I, I had to say it. Yeah. So do these, do these uh, mealy bugs encounter these bacteria at any time? Would they encounter them in nature? Uh, undoubtedly they would, but uh, this these events that we're describing probably happened a long time ago. I mean, I mean would, would they eat material that would be having these bacteria in them? That's well, I don't know. That sap is probably usually sterile, but yeah. it doesn't have to be. And uh, you know, they 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 may encounter this bacteria in nature. Sure. Are you asking the question of horizontal transmission to? The mealybug, or are you yeah, asking to the about vert vertical transmission, where the mealybug transfers it down to its offspring, and the bacteria are just oh, coincidentally replicated? Yeah, no, it's still out. The, the insects all carry these bugs, so uh, they, it's it's transferred vertically. But it doesn't mean that they can't acquire other bacteria as they go along. I mean, obviously they do. They don't, they don't live in a sterile environment. Yeah, I'm just curious. The, of the bacteria that they found, the sequences anyway, are these bacteria that they would encounter in nature normally? Oh, I see. Because if they're not even in nature, then it's a hard way to explain. It's hard to explain how they acquired them. That's why I know it happened yeah, a long no, time ago. Yeah. No, You're I, asking I the when anybody. question. When no, did they get? No, not when, when did they get them? But are they in the environment such that uh, mealybugs would 
would pick them up? That's the question. And okay. We probably don't know the answer, but someone who works on these would know. Yeah, that'd be nice to know. But as I say, I, well, that's true, but it could have happened a long time ago. Yep. And it could have happened with different kind of hosts than we know now. It doesn't have to be the same kind of plant host yeah, sure, that they sure. just feed on. They probably, their ancestors may have fed on who knows what. And that yeah. could have been, had a different biota than what we have now. Do you think, Elio, that the horizontal transfer occurred first and then the symbiosis was established? Boy, that's a good question. Um, maybe not. I, actually, uh, it, the, here's part of it. The Tremblaya genome reduction does not seem to be finished. Mm. Okay, And the reason for saying that is that it has a ve- the genome of this Tremblaya, which is very few genes to begin with, has a low coding capacity. That is, if you look at how much of the genome is coding, it turns out to be 73%, whereas in the Moranella, which is the, the endo-endo, it is 93%, which is more rational. So in, a, in bacteria in general, the coding capacity is fairly high. They don't carry many, uh, they don't carry many pseudogenes, they don't carry uh, much in the way of uh, inserts and so forth, which are not expressed. So here is this bug with a reduced, reduced, reduced genome, and it doesn't even use the whole genome. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So the, the idea is this must be work in progress. It must be getting even further degenerated. And the reason it can do that is because it gets help from its own endosymbiont. And by the way, let me let me say a little bit about the mechanism that may be involved. We're changing subject here a little bit, but bear with me. So you have a bacterium inside the bacterium. How do they transport their mm-hmm. the goodies? I mean, like for instance, tRNA synthetases. If they come from the moranella, the endo endo, how do they get to the endo, the tremblaya? And there are no transport mechanisms that are known to do that that can export macromolecules just like that. It's for tRNA synthetases, I doubt that anybody knows of a transport specific for them. So the idea is that the moranella, the inside guy, lyses. And if it lyses, it can release anything into the cytoplasm of the tremblaya, which can pick up these proteins and these enzymes and use them. So that's the idea. Mm-hmm. But I'm not answering the question you originally asked. Which happened first, the, with the endosymbiosis or the horizontal gene transfer to the nucleus? I don't. I, I doubt that anybody knows. I, I, I didn't run into that in the paper. I guess it could that's happen in... Uh, it could happen either way because sure. even if the genes are not yet in the mealybug, you, know, you could acquire bacteria which are competent, and then they they could lose them after the genes are acquired later. Could happen yeah. first. Could happen either That's way. Right. Yeah. And as long as the life cycle requires that the endo endo lyses in order to in its life history to lyse first, so that you have both nucleic acid and protein and base building blocks released from the bacterium, that's the endo, endo, Mm -hmm. then you could see how natural selection would favor incorporation into the mealybug, Mm. or you would facilitate the selection for efficiency. Because it's efficiency that's going to drive the reduction of the genome of the host, because energetically it probably costs the host more because they have to replicate all of the host, mm. which is much bigger than the bacterium, which is much smaller. So from the energy budget of the collective organism, it's cheaper for the bacterium to die than it is for the host to replicate all that genetic burden. And as Alio said, it hasn't yet finished deciding what genes it wants to keep forever. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And by the way, this introduces a very interesting argument that is, goes on. What's the difference between this highly reduced endosymbiont and an organelle? Right. And if, I'll remind you that some mitochondria have quite a few more genes than the humans. I think there is one with some 80 KB versus about 20 KB, which is, I think, the human mitochondria. And chloroplasts have even more. There are plasties that have about 130 KB. So there's an overlap. Some, some, some organelles may have genomes larger than the endo-endo we're talking about here. So what's the difference between an endosymbiont with a 
super reduced genome and an organelle. And uh, you can argue forever because, in fact, they have to be very similar in it, in concept. Organelles started the same way. They started as endosymbionts, or so we think. So, um, uh, and by the way, uh, there's a guy, uh, Mark Martin at the Puget Sound has a button which he carries around. It says, free the organelles. <laughs> 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 so, you know, what, what the, what's the difference between an organelle and an endosymbiont? And the answer is, it's whatever you make it. Uh, endosymbionts retain more or less the morphology of bacteria, whereas mm. you, can't, uh, you can't really say that mitochondria looked all that much like bacteria. They do in a way, and in a way they don't. So um, it's it's really a very arbitrary definition. One that I liked, however, which McCutcheon and Moran used in a paper, is they say an organelle is found in every cell, mm-hmm. and the endosymbionts are not. It's a mm-hmm. functional definition that may be useful. Hmm. What do you think? It sounds good. So these endos are not in every uh Mealy no. bug cell. Mm. No, they're they're only in the bacteriocytes. Sites. Where are they located in the insect? Uh, in the gut. Usually. In the gut tract. Yeah. They say in this paper that um, it's not an organelle because, um, well, at least it hasn't got, undergone parallel evolution because its genes didn't go into the host nucleus, whereas, right. you know, as you said before, the mitochondrial right. genes did go into the nucleus. That's right. That's very true. That's interesting, by the way. The bacterial nuclear uh, genes in the nucleus are not from the endosymbionts. Right, except. right. So that's that's really a distinction. Yeah. But, you know, you can make these distinctions forever. The fact is, there's probably something of a continuum in the development of organelles and endosymbionts. Mm. Uh, before we leave the subject, let me just point out that Nancy Moran, the other person that's a distinguished worker in this field, uh, published a similar piece of paper a few months afterwards, and uh, it's called, it's by Sloan, Nakabachi, Richards, Q, Murali, Gibbs, and Moran. It's called Parallel Histories of Horizontal Gene Transfer Facilitated Extreme Reduction of Endosymbiont Genomes in Sap Feeding Insects. And this is work done with different insects, namely psyllids, not aphids. And the story is very similar. The story is very, very similar. And so they make a point of comparing and contrasting two analogous findings and saying that this may be a phenomenon, namely the genes transfer from bacteria to the nucleus uh, and complementing the genes that are found in endosymbionts. That story may be more general than we know. Psyllid is also a sap sucking yep. insect. And yep. it's not an aphid, is it? No, no, it's, it's psyllid. So uh, yeah, I had to look it up. I don't know really what's silly, but they are they are well known mm-hmm. plant pests. All of these are plant pests, by the way. Those readers who those listeners who are gardeners uh, probably may cringe at listening to all these pests. But they're <laughs> fascinating. So <laughs> aphids also have these symbioses, right? These endosymbionts. Oh yeah, they're the classic ones. Du- this du- is what we're talking yeah. about. The, the one we're talking about yeah. is aphids. Anything that's probably eating a nitrogen deficient. Uh, food mm. source would probably right. require to have these endosymbiotes. I wanted to ask what you two guys thought of the fact that the host was actually controlling peptidoglycan biosynthesis and its relation to morinella. Mm. Right, that's really an interesting point. Um, the reason in part is that peptidoglycan is purely a bacterial product. Right. Nobody else makes it. So what are genes doing in the host controlling peptidoglycan synthesis? And the answer is I don't know, but it's really fascinating. Well, since it came on the heels of the uh, Pseudomonas and anthrax story that we read a couple of weeks ago, and we learned that things like um, Staph aureus and Bacillus, which are gram-positives, turn over a large fraction of their peptidoglycan every generation cycle. I'm wondering if this is an old, ancient behavior that is being exploited by the eukaryotic host in order to do good work for the eukaryote. Mm. Hey, that's good thinking. Hey, could be. I don't know. I wanted, Lots of food for thought here. I wanted to point out uh, some of the 
methodology, which is really interesting. They actually did genome sequences of two different tremblias, right. one with and one without Moranella, right? Right. So the one c- without Moranella has a much bigger genome they could and compare, makes yeah. up for what, what's missing. Right. Yeah. Then they did a transcriptome of the mealybug, mm-hmm. which is the RNAs that are made, so they could try and see where these the needed genes came from. And to confirm it, they did a draft sequence of the mealybug genome. Right. To make sure that the RNAs they saw weren't yeah. artifacts. There's a lot of work in this paper. Well, the, re- yeah, the reason for this is because it's not trivial to determine that the gene in the nucleus is of bacterial origin. That's yeah. a very difficult problem. Right. So they did it very, very elegantly. It's a nice paper. This is a course in cell biology. I mean, if, right. you, if, you, if you go through, you know, the, the old adage is if, if you know syphilis, you know medicine. Well, if you go through some of these <laughs> endosymbiotes, well, that's the famous quote from Osler, one why, of the founders of… Because you learn everything from syphilis? Yeah, syphilis because of its protean manifestations. Yeah. Um, it, you learn because it's uh, the tertiary forms of syphilis are often confused with uh, various cancers. And uh, we just had an enrichment lecture yesterday from our oral pathologist who took the, our dental students through syphilis. And uh, it was absolutely fascinating. I had already given them the lecture, lecture uh, two weeks ago on the oral treponemes and the treponemes. Mm. But you know, looking for these truisms, this paper really is an exercise in, in cell biology because of the importance of organelles to, you know, just mammals in general, you yeah. know, mm, and sure. and chloroplasts to plants and yeah. understanding this dynamic equilibrium going on. And I think if you step back and think about what the biggest and hottest topics in our discipline are is today, and that's namely the microbiome and how to use it to improve health. Just think if we can figure out one before TWIM, we discuss the importance of butyric acid mm-hmm. in in the microbes that are secreting it at the an intestinal epithelial layer. Just imagine if we could get our epithelial layer to secrete this butyric acid that would keep our colon healthy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if the genes came from the microbe and, you know, will mammals evolve or will we figure out how to incorporate butyric acid secreting conditions in our epithelial layer and yeah. papers like this can help us think about how mother nature has accomplished this tax because when you look at table one the express horizontally transferred genes found in this work it's a who's who of enzymology. <laughs> mm-hmm. And you look at some of the enzymes that are involved, and you can immediately appreciate how this paper could become a primer to teach the microbiome folks yeah. of how to approach some of these really cool experiments that, you know, the observational science is, is revealing about the importance of microbiome and health. So I think. Folks, you, you heard it right here. You heard it right here. <laughs> you heard it right here. There'll be, a, there'll, there'll be a transfer of bacterial genes to people, to, uh, human cells someday. Well, I, that's, that's why I thought we may be just too young. Uh, the, the insects have shorter generation times. You know, it's, it, it's hmm. really, um, it, it was just absolutely fascinating. Yeah, good. I'm, but Michael, I'm we also, we're not always, not only just young, but we, we, supply all our nutrient needs you know artificially really we make whatever we need so not quite wait a minute no 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 10 amino acids we we're, we we're short 10 we eat vitamins it. that's i'm saying we eat what we need we eat what we need sure. right so yeah. i mean yeah. these these bugs right. the evolved. Insects, these bugs do, these insects don't yeah they that's decided true. to eat sap and nothing right. else and so they became this but we can eat whatever we want It'd be the equivalent of just uh, subsizing on Coca-Cola only. Yeah, in that case, then we'd get some symbionts, right? Right. <laughs> Isn't that the diet of most graduate students? <laughs> I thought it was. Apparently, um, Coffee and cigarettes at one point in time. Apparently, the CEO of Apple eats Mountain Dew and, uh, and, and protein bars. Oh, okay. my. Tim Cook. Okay, well, shall we move to our second Why offering? Not? It's just as exciting, if not more so. This is a... Um, Paper published recently in PNAS just last week, 
It is called a 30,000-year-old distant relative of giant icosahedral DNA viruses with a Pandora virus morphology. And the authors are Legendre Bartoli, Shmakova, Judy Labadie, Adre Lesco Poirot, not Hercule, but Olivier Poirot, oh. Berto Bruli, Coute, Rivkina, Abergel, and Claveri. These individuals are from Aix Marseille Université in Marseille and also in uh, Moscow and uh, other places in France, Grenoble. And actually, uh, Chantal and Jean-Michel, the two senior authors, I interviewed for TWIV number 261. So if you want to hear them talking about their big virus isolation, you should Mm -hmm. go over there. They're in Marseille, right? They're in Marseille, yes. Not a bad place to be. I don't know. Is it really? I have only been there for a very brief time. I well, it's in the Côte d'Azur. Okay. Well, I think it is. Anyhow, nice place. So um, this continues. This group has been uh, central to isolating what we call giant DNA viruses. They're really, really huge particles over 700 nanometers and with big genomes of a million base pairs and up. And they are previously, they and others at Marseille initially were responsible for the Mimi virus discovery and then subsequently megaviruses. And then not too long ago, Pandora viruses, which at one micron uh, in length, and 2.5 or 2.8 million base pair genome. They're the biggest viruses ever discovered. Considerably bigger than quite a few free-living bacteria. Exactly. I mean, look at the one you talked about. Uh, what was it, 139 KB? Yeah. <laughs> right. oh, not, what's the smallest free-living uh, bacterial genome? Do you remember offhand? Uh, I, wait. A few uh, million? Well, my, mycoplasma genitalium. Yeah. Yeah. It's not it's normally the first one that they were sequenced. It can give you colonies on agar, so it can grow yeah. uh, uh, independently. It's 500,000 base pairs. So the Pandoras had 2.8 million base pairs. They are huge, and they still require a cell, of course. These are viruses. They need to, <laughs> they're parasites. They need to get inside the cell and replicate. And they don't divide by binary fission. They, they fly do not. apart. They do they not. They reassemble, right? That's right. They make the parts and make new viruses. Exactly. Yeah, and that, I think, to me, is the definition of a virus. The fact that it is not a cellular entity, meaning that it, mm-hmm. uh, it loses its bodily integrity in the process of replication. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Now, these uh, Mimis and Pandoras were all, all able to propagate in an amoeba called uh, um, Acantamoeba. Acantamoeba Castellani. It was an Italian guy, uh, Elio Castellani. Uh, Castellani was a curious guy. He was a nobleman uh-huh. who worked in England, I believe. Uh, I think he even worked in the United States. He was a very fine parasitologist, but a kind of a strange person. Uh, hmm. He wrote an interesting book. I, I didn't read the book, though. <laughs> so they used this amoeba, which you can grow, and they took... Now, they went and they obtained samples from Siberia. So they wanted to know if DNA viruses could last a long time. They said there's some growing evidence that infectivity can last over geological time scales. And they went to look in Siberia because it has a neutral pH and reducing in anaerobic properties. The, ser- the permafrost would be a good place to look for surviving microorganisms. So they got a sample of ice, which had been taken uh, from the tundra near the East Siberian Sea. It had, been, it had been collected in 2000, and this was by drilling. So they drilled uh, a very big... Um, drill down into the ice, and they say here they didn't use mud to cool it so it wouldn't contaminate it. Uh, and then they took from the center of the drill core a piece of sample, which was then frozen since 2000. So this they acquired from someone else. They never had never been thawed since then. And they used radiocarbon uh, dating to estimate that this sample was between 34,000 and 37,000 years old. All right, so this is pretty old. And it was buried 30 meters below the surface. Okay. 30 meters, my God. Yeah, 30 meters below. So it was That's gotten, a lot of ice. It was gotten by yeah. drilling. So this never melts. You know, it's only the top part of the, the but surface. But over 30,000 years, it must have 
It melted at one it point. Must have melted at some point. It started out melted, didn't it? I don't know. That I don't know. Yeah. All right, so they take this uh, sample, and they thaw it, and they mix it with a little uh, medium, uh, and then they simply use that to infect a Cantamoeba castellani in the lab. And they say they looked at these cultures over the time, and in a few days they saw big particles being released. And uh, these were 1.5 microns long and 500 nanometers, half a micron in diameter. And it turned out that these, these were viruses, big, really big viruses. They looked at them by electron microscopy. And, show, and you could see that they look just like or very similar to Pandora viruses, which are ovoid particles with a thick uh, envelope here. It's 60 nanometers thick. And an internal region, a compartment that has no particular structure, but where the nucleic acid, of course, must be. And interestingly, at one end of the particle, so the Pandora viruses have an interesting structure at one end, which is thought to be where the genome ex escapes when these viruses infect cells. And they say there's a structure at one end, which they call a cork. Mm -hmm. They call it a protruding cork. And it's very interesting. Uh, it has an interesting hexagonal structure, which reminds us of uh, virus particles. So they named this virus... Pitho, sorry. <laughs> Pithovirus. Pithovirus. Uh, what is the second part? Oh my gosh. Sibiricum. Pithovirus Sibiricum. And pitho comes from the Greek word pithos, which has to do with the amphora handed to the gods by Pandora. So it's amphora shaped, and that's one reason. And the other is it makes a connection with Pandora virus, which uh, is the other giant virus okay it's of similar age um well pandora virus was a, was a isolated off the coast of chile and uh, within australia so that's a contemporary uh, virus this one is clearly thirty thousand years old because of the dating of the sediment in which uh, it was found they show so the particle let's go through the particle morphology first so as i said they are very pandora virus like they're ovoid with a thick membrane and an internal compartment and they have this cork uh, at one end looks a lot like pandora virus and let me ask you what yep. what about the this envelope they have this is a really a very thick wall they don't know much about it do they no so it's basically made, no? it looks like there's a membrane and then below it there's what they call a tegument which uh, is probably at least partially proteinaceous um, and uh, may have other components in it as well. So I don't think it's all, it's all membrane. Um, and, the mem and this membrane or this outer shell, if you will, is pretty big. It's 60 nanometers. It's very thick, yeah. 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 Um, they, and they so they infect uh, amoeba cultures and they study the replication of this virus. Uh, it replicates in uh, 10 to 20 hours. So it's not the quickest, but not the longest either. Uh, and as soon as the viruses infect, they lose their cork. <laughs> and uh, they think this is how the, the DNA gets out. We haven't told you it's DNA virus yet, but we, it is DNA in there. Uh, the nucleus remains intact of the cells. Uh, and then uh, the particles begin eventually to be assembled in the cytoplasm in what they call factories. This is very typical of, of big DNA viruses. Uh, and then six to eight hours, uh, they come out of the cells, start coming out of the uh, Sorry, at six to eight hours, you can see various stages of uh, maturation. And one of the things I really like, they say, you can see pieces of cork in the cytoplasm of the cell. Uh, let, let, me, let me interrupt. Let me introduce something, something in, in aside. Yeah. Um, uh, Joe Poliano at uh, UC San Diego has found that there are some big, big phages, which are yeah. huge genomes, and they assemble in factories also in the middle of the bacterium. Yeah. We ought to go, we'll go through that sometime. Yeah, we should do well, that. Well, the other thing I'd like to make as an aside is the average eclipse phase for a uh, uh, bacteriophage in something like E. coli is only mm -hmm. 40 minutes. So look at the difference in the eclipse phase when... Mm. The eclipse phase is when viruses are assembling into new viruses. And so this one is is much longer with uh, mm. four to six hours as opposed to 40 minutes. Yeah. So. 
So these, uh, then eventually the cells break open, the amoeba break open, and that's how the viruses appear to get out of it. And they release hundreds of particles by lysis. And they, in Alio, they say here, no images of particles undergoing binary fission were encountered, <laughs> hinting at the viral nature prior, prior to the analysis of their gene content. So I like when people uh, are rooted in traditional microbiology like that, right? Mm. All right, they sequence the genome. And it turns out to be uh, not as big as you would think for such a big particle. It's 610, they call it a mere 610,033 <laughs> base pairs. I think that's funny that mere remains in the manuscript. Uh, and um, it is not really related to the Pandora viruses at all. It shares very few genes. Uh, the number or anything of, else. Or anything else. I mean, it's closest to the Marseille viruses, which are... Uh, relatives of Mimi's, uh, but not quite. And uh, so it's very interesting that the most similar virus are, are, are viruses with icosahedral capsids. And this one, of course, it has an, a, a membrane uh, around it. So it has um, 610,000 bases, as I said, genome, double-stranded DNA genome. Uh, it encodes 467 proteins, predicted proteins, and only 100 52 of these are recognizable. So if you search the NCBI database, 152 proteins are recognizable as having some motif that says it's a polymerase or a glycosylase or some other uh, kind of protein. So a lot of them are brand new and don't match up with anything that we have. And as I said, they have the most similarity to the Marseille and the, the Megaviridae and also virus, big viruses of other species, but not to the Pandora. So despite being morphologically similar, uh, it's quite different from uh, the Pandora virus genome. So all of the enzymes that you need to make messenger RNA are encoded in the viral genome, the RNA polymerase, and associated proteins. And so the prediction is that this uh, virus would replicate entirely in the cytoplasm, like many other DNA viruses do, like pox viruses. And the re requisite for that, of course, is not only to encode the transcriptional machinery, but to have it in the virus particle. And in fact, they do a proteomic analysis of this virus. They purify virus, and they sequence the proteins and in fact it does have a complete set of transcriptional proteins and they call this the sine qua non for a fully cytoplasmic replication cycle and that's also that's also a feature of the megaviridae which to which these are very similar and the pox viruses which of course infect uh, animals so what I find really interesting is that not only is this thing very old, it's been clearly infectious in that permafrost for 30,000 years, but most of the genes are brand new. Mm -hmm. So where did this virus come from? We don't know what its actual host is, right? Because even though it grows in a canthamoeba, it doesn't mean it's the natural host uh, in nature. Mm. Where did well, remember, 30,000 years ago, we had mastodon wandering the planet. So, you know, there are giant elephants that are ruminants. And so are the acantamoeba associated with the gut of mastodons? Or? Uh, that I don't know. We do have mastodon sequence, don't we? Yeah. Mammoth sequence anyway. But this would have to be very different because if it were derived from a mammal, it should have some similarity to mammalian genes, and it just doesn't. Now, when the, no. when the mimes were identified first, uh, and a lot of their genes were shown to be novel, the idea arose that maybe these viruses originally were in a fourth domain of life, which is extinct now. But now we have Pandora and now these uh, pithy viruses, pithoviruses, which are totally different as well. So you can't have so many different domains of life, at least the In way 30,000 years is too soon to lose exactly. a remnant of sure. one of the four, a fourth kingdom. It's yeah, exactly. So uh, something's going on here that we have to sort out. So I think that's really interesting. So this is the oldest eukaryote infecting DNA virus revived to date. They also make this interesting point that as the permafrost thaws, you know, from warming, and as we explore it for looking for minerals and oil, you know, maybe we're going to release viruses uh, on a regular basis, and who knows what they might do. So we probably should go back up there and see what else is up there. Now, of course, 
they didn't do genomic sequencing and that would tell you the whole the whole story of what's up there but they just tried to culture this which is very interesting in itself but it might be worth while to go back to these samples and uh, do deep sequencing and find out the extent of what's there but that's really the gold standard of this paper is the fact that they actually got virus from this nucleic acid from the sample yeah from the sample absolutely they got, this is they amazing got, they got virus and if you think about it um you know, DNA is a is a chemical molecule that is subject to decay. Mm -hmm. And 30,000 years, just thinking about the number of cosmic ray hits that will go through the permafrost and, you know, mm. that the fact that it's an intact viral particle and there's no repair going on in the virus because the DNA is effectively inert yeah sitting while, there, right why it's in a so there's no repair mechanism that's going to go and fix it when it's in the virion so that's and there's no host to pass it through because it's in a frozen suspended state yeah so th this is absolutely incredible and and they make a comment about you know now uh, people are beginning to think that dna could be viable on a million year time scale yeah which is just absolutely incredible. So, yeah, this is a really stunning finding that this has been there. And I wonder how much longer we can we can find things. And someone pointed out, I had written about this online the other day, someone pointed out, you know, the these frozen areas have been thawing and freezing over the years. So who knows if something is frozen for 50,000 or 100,000 years, then it's released. That's a different kind of of progression from evolution, right? Because you have something that's stopped, it's been in stasis, and now you release it to perhaps a different environment altogether. So, really is interesting. That, is that punctuated equilibrium? <laughs> he called it um, uh, Arctic virology or something like that. Yeah, it's quite different. Paleo, paleo virology. Paleo virology yeah. is old stuff, yeah. yeah. What do you think of this, Alia? Do you think this is cool? I think it's terrific. <laughs> I mean, the whole, the whole subject of giant viruses is mind-boggling. I mean, this is, nobody knew about them until recently. And there wasn't even a hint of that. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we have a, what looks like a large group of, of viruses, which are large and common. They're common. And uh, yeah. I think that this, one has to wrap one's head around it, as they say, because it's so unusual. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, I, and I suspect that we just seen the beginning of this. I no, suspect absolutely. that we lost more. So they have a nice I think it's so generous of you, Vincent, to bring this over to TWIM instead of TWIF. <laughs> <laughs> it's really big of you. I'm, well, you, you I want to get a talk, nice guy, Victor. I Vincent. wanted to talk about it right away. And uh, I thought, well, it's microbiology, right? Well, you betcha. Well, in defense of Vincent, this is not a filterable agent. A, a 0.2 <laughs> micron filter would capture these things. You got to throw that out of the de definition of viruses for well, sure. Well, this huh? is true because remember that's how viruses were originally defined sure. back exactly. in the early 20th century: is they were filterable agents. Right. So yeah, this one, this is bigger than some bacteria, right? Oh right. yeah, 1.5 micron. You can see it in the light microscope. Yeah, which is yeah, really pretty the cool. Supplement. There's a neat picture showing him in the under the light microscope. Yeah. They're very visible. I mean, look, they're, they're almost the size of an E. coli, a small E. coli. Yep. In fact, the original Mimi virus was isolated, uh, and from I think a patient with a lung with a respiratory infection, and they looked at it and they said, "Oh, it's a it's a bacteria," and they put it in the freezer. And it <laughs> sat there for years until someone went back and looked at it, tried to grow it in amoeba, and it turned out to be a virus. And by the way, there is a recent report of finding one of these giant viruses in a patient. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, do you know, one of them, you want to make something of that? Or? Yeah, so there have been. There is a report uh, from the French, uh, the different group at Marseille, that they could isolate uh, some of these giant viruses from Probably. patients with respiratory disease, and they're looking for antibodies. So I don't know if they're... Um, if 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 they are a cause of disease, it's not very major in people because they're not frequently isolated. Sure. They may occasionally be able to replicate in an immunocompromised individual, someone with a, a weak immune system maybe. 
Um, so you think you think that there would be really, if it were a problem, that antiviral therapy would really be possible because they have so many targets. Well, sure, you know, sure, you, and they're so different. It. Yeah, that would be. Uh, a be bit easy easier. to find the drug that yeah. hits them. But it's reminiscent of Legionella, right, which grows in, in amoeba as well, mm-hmm. correct? That's right. Hey, that's right. Really, that's yeah. the natural history of, of Legionella. It's its normal host is amoeba. Right. So then in cooling towers, the amoeba and the Legionella are present, right? Right. And then you inhale the aerosolized bacteria yeah. and you get an infection. So maybe the same thing is here. Maybe there are... There are amoeba in the cooling waters infected with these viruses, and periodically people inhale them, and they can be infected. So were the Mimi viruses associated with macrophages, like uh, the Legionella are? I don't think they know that. I think they just, uh, you know, but, tried to amplify. They had the a sequence. lung biopsy but, and they but amplified I think, it. Yeah, yeah and they but had I think just, the reason why amoebas are the preferred host in the lab, at least, may be that amoebas are very good at swallowing particles mm-hmm. that not everybody is, and so. Um, you know, it seems to me that the requirement for being a host to these giant viruses is to be very good at phagocytosis. Yes, and, that's, uh, and they're protected with that 60 nanometer or 600 angstrom right. yeah. protective layer. That's right. right. Yeah, that's been brought up, Baleo. That's people have wondered about the the eating pro, uh, the eating uh, habits of amoeba. Yeah. There's a you very know, other things on I mean, flagellates and and uh, yeah. ciliates also sw- eat things. But uh, maybe not as well as amoebas. I don't know. Yeah. The they, process um, will be different in, in other protists. Yep. They have uh, a nice ta- a figure here showing uh, how they cluster these viruses, these big DNA viruses, according to their DNA polymerases. And you can see that these pithoviruses cluster with uh, Marseille virus and Lausanne virus, two other big Viruses, yeah, but those are, actually, don't they? those are icosahedral, and they're quite different from Mimi viruses and megaviruses and other viruses of protists, like uh, uh, there's they have a virus, um, oh, several viruses of protists, which are also very large and icosahedral. So I think you're right. We're at the beginning of, of this whole story. There are probably lots of big ones out there. Oh, one more thing I wanted to point out here. So this virus is 1.5 microns. The Pandoras are one micron, and their genome is 2.8 million base pairs. So this genome is very small compared to the capacity of the particle, mm. 600,000 base pairs. So that's still a lot of genes. It's still it a is, lot it genes. is a lot, but it's there's probably a lot of space in this uh, particle. Yeah. Yeah. You and can chock a block it full. So one of the ideas about how big DNA viruses arose is they came from cells, and then they underwent gene reduction. You know, very much like your endosymbionts. As they went into a host, they lost genes that they didn't need anymore. So this, and one thing about that idea that always bothered me is how did the capsid readjust? Because most capsids are pretty close around the the viral genomic uh, DNA. And so maybe this one recently lost a lot of genes and the capsid hasn't adjusted yet. Who knows? Anyway, it's a really cool paper. Yes. I highly recommend it. People check it out. All right. I have a couple of email here that I would like uh, to read. The first one is from Laurel, who writes, Hello, all. I am a graduate student at University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, in the microbiology and immunology department. And since my lab is mainly focused on the immunology section of that, I try to supplement my microbial knowledge with information gleaned from other sources, like your podcasts, though I am a particular fan of Parasites and TWIP. And as you can probably tell from this comment being so behind, I am never caught up with the podcasts, though I listen to them regardless. You all mentioned that perhaps due to the high salt levels and temperatures of the lake, the halo archaea from TWIM-68 act very similarly to when you perform a transformation in their extremely high gene transfer rate. Wouldn't it be fairly easy to test this theory since the authors demonstrated that they grow at many different temperatures? You could follow growth at room temperature and examine if comparable gene transfer takes place. I just wondered if any had considered looking into that to determine if that's the case. Thanks. Nice comment. You remember that we, the paper yeah. said uh, halo archaea take up genes, right? Mm-hmm. And so we someone commented, it was like transforming, you know, you put mm-hmm. them in high salt. Right. And, that's how we make competent cells. Yeah. 
So yeah, I suppose you could do it. I bet they're doing it, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right, the next one's from Jeffrey, who writes, uh, While your show has been a real eye-opener for me in so many ways, much of my interest in the microbial world remains in the areas of endo and ectophytic microbes, soil micro- microbial ecology, and food, energy, raw materials fermentation. You speak frequently, and I have noticed rather lovingly, of exploratory deep genome sequencing just to try to find out what's in the environment. Though a little more narrowly focused, that is exactly the kind of research that I am reading about frequently in my areas of interest. What is the microbiome of a withania leaf, miso, a pong, wine, beer from moldy rice, hydrogen <laughs> bubbling mud, and Ooh. other topics of that nature? I won't pretend to understand all the techniques that are being used to genetically identify the microbes in these environments, but it is of interest to note that much of what we thought we knew due to culture techniques isn't particularly accurate. Culture techniques often skew results toward easily culturable microbes, which can greatly distort our reconstruction of microbial communities, especially reconstructions of microbial succession, and completely misses the contributions of non-culturable organisms. Recent techniques involving direct analysis of DNA present has greatly expanded our knowledge of these communities, but different techniques often produce different results. We are still expanding and improving these techniques, and more importantly, learning how to apply them so they complement each other's strength and weaknesses and give us unprecedentedly clear views of microbial communities. With all that introduction done, I now present my question. I assume that deep genomic diving involves many of the same techniques used in the shallower explorations mentioned above, and viruses definitely provide a deep and wide pool of non-culturable organisms. Would you be able to discuss some of the major DNA RNA detection techniques used in this field in terms of their strengths and weaknesses, and how different researchers are overlapping their use to build robustness into their studies of microbiome and virome? Mm. So, Jeffrey, it just so happens that we are going to do that on another podcast. And uh, it's going to be a podcast all about this sort of thing. So stay tuned. All right? I w- that's the hint I will give you. And we'll have, <laughs> we'll have experts in these areas, not me, but other people who do this for a living talking about it. So it's coming up. Uh, next one is from Alice, who writes, Thanks to Vincent et al. for the wonderful podcast series, all three. I am a fellow in pediatric infectious diseases. A fellow is the MD equivalent of a postdoc for subspecialty training. Your podcasts are thought-provoking and timely and always intellectually stimulating, so thank you. In return, the temperature here in Cleveland Heights is currently 15 degrees Fahrenheit, winds Ooh. west mm. at 7 miles per hour, humidity 72%, and I'm really tired of winter. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Regarding TWIM72, your discussion of this paper, uh, that's the one where the uh, bacteria are making butyric acid, right, Mike? Right. I think that was. Your discussion of this paper coincided with my caring for a patient with a surgical procedure known as a ureterosigmoidoscopy in which the ureters are implanted into the distal colon when the bladder is not present or can't be used for some reason, e.g. congenital malformation. In the process of caring for this person, I learned that there is a significantly increased risk of cancer developing in the bowel. After this surgery, the urine drains into the bowel and greatly changes the chemistry and flora present. Examination of the microbiota and or metabolome of these patients may turn out to be quite interesting. Thanks for making me think differently about our relationship to microorganisms every day. And Alice Please. is an MD PhD. So she sent a bunch of references. This is very interesting, right? It's absolutely fascinating because it, it turns people into birds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> cloaca. Right, yeah. right, right. Michael, you were going to say? I, w- I was going to say this, this goes to the importance of having the right microbe at the right location and Just by changing the conditions of having urine, which is profoundly different because of the urea that's in there, it's going to change the pH. So the microbes aren't going to occupy the same niche Mm. and they're not going to make the butyric acid. The epithelial layer will change and Mm. the net result is is cancer. So it it really validates the the cancer hypothesis that the microbiome is is really critical in colonic health. Yeah. Someone needs to look at those patients and see the nature of the microbiome and how it's changed, right? 
Yeah. That would be very revealing. Absolutely. I mean, you look at the it, the the publications are fairly recent. They're 2011, 2010. Um, so it's it's not unusual that they could go back and maybe, you know, get some stool samples or go in with a, a scope and yep. actually yep. pull out the epithelial layer and see who's attached and see whether or not a stool transplant could could work in the interim. But my guess is they'll never attach. Hmm. Good idea, Alice. Good listening. All right. Uh, the next one's from Clark. I was wondering if you had seen this recent paper on detection of oral bacterial DNA in synovial fluid. Given that one of the frequent hosts teaches dentists, I would be especially interested in his comments about the relationship of periodontal bacteria in other diseases. I think it'd make a very interesting discussion for non-microbiologists like myself. My background is physics. A wow. doctor friend of mine created an RSS feed on this topic, so it seemed like there's been a lot of work done on this. And the paper he sent is Detection of Oral Bacterial DNA in Synovial Fluid. Michael, how does it get from the mouth to the synovial fluid? It moves via the blood. Because every time uh, you brush your teeth, right? You're bacteremic uh, approximately eight hours each day if you brush your teeth twice. Hmm. So four hours in the morning and four hours in the evening. And in fact, that's why, um, you know, for the most part, your liver and spleen process the bacteria out quite efficiently. But occasionally they can take root and, and move. And, you know, that's how our friend's staff thinks to cause so many osteomyelitis and you know they just move around and when you have a wound they get stuck and synovial fluid is oftentimes chock-a-block full of staph or other oral bacteria so hmm. these patients in this study were with rheumatoid arthritis yeah so they they have a a, a nidus from which a, a bacterial infection can you know sort of be happy hmm. and they, so, um, so do you the think force, do you think this has anything to do with their rheumatoid disease? It could. Mm. It it very well could because of the um, it, chronic inflammatory process that's going on. And, you know, staph and, and strep are just wonders at, a, at avoiding our immune system. Hmm. Oh. And there's other oral bacteria other than... Other than the streptococci, yeah. staph is staph is a rarer player. I mean, there's the whole suite of gram negatives. There's Agrarobacterium actinomycomatans that's uh, associated with periodontal disease. There's Prevotella and Porphyrmonas and all sorts of other strange creatures. Hmm. So, do people work on this issue? This yeah, the Forsyth Institute uh, up in Boston is probably hmm. the ones that are doing the most cutting edge research. They've been involved heavily in the oral microbiome as well as a number, uh, of course, the Dental Institute out of the National Institutes of Health has funded much of the um, oral microbiome work. And so, it, it's a really hot topic. Nice. All right. Thank you for that, Clark. And thanks, everyone, for their letters. You can find this episode of TWIM at iTunes and also at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. If you like what we do here, go on over to iTunes. If you can subscribe, that would be great. And also leave a comment or a, a rating in terms of stars. That helps to keep us visible there and let people find us and learn about this very, very interesting world of microbes. And we do love getting your questions and comments, and you can send those by email to twim, T-W-I-M, at twiv, T-W-I-V dot TV. Elio Schechter can be found at the very nice blog called Small Things Considered. Thanks for joining us, Elio. My pleasure, of course. Always is. And Michael Schmidt is at the university, the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. My pleasure as well. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, and Chris Kandayan and Ray Ortega for technical help. The music we use on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.
Boy, that was good, wasn't it? Yeah, these are two great stories, I tell you. Great stories. They tell themselves. CNN was going crazy. Yeah, you know, CNN was going crazy on this this Siberian virus. Oh, yeah, it's all over the place. It's everywhere, yeah. People get really excited by reviving things after 30,000 years, right? Well, they should. That are just old. Yeah. Great story. Great story. It's amazing, given the... the, the, um, you know, the grant climate that such great work still continues, you know? Yeah. Well, that goes yeah. back to Alio's first comment about the internationalism of science. And, you know, a lot of these labs, you know, the one, the first paper, the horizontal gene transfer, you know, there were a lot of institutes in that study. And that's yeah, the only way yeah. a lot of the science can get done because one individual can afford to do this work. Yep. All right, guys. Thank you so much. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Vincent. Take good care. Keep warm. Yes. (laughs) 